I'm Ernie Humphrey, Educational Programs Leader for Performative, the largest online community for corporate finance, accounting, treasury, and related professionals. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, 10 Best Practices for Optimizing Your ERP Investment. Leading a successful ERP implementation can be a career-defining event for a finance leader. Understanding the costs, challenges, and benefits of your options is critical. Today, we will review 10 key best practices in developing and executing an ERP implementation strategy that helps maximize the ROI of an ERP solution investment and discover how an ERP implementation done right enhances the company's agility and capacity to thrive in a high growth environment. I would like to thank NetSuite, whose commitment to thought leadership helps us make this webinar possible and deliver at no cost. A quick note on today's agenda, first we will hear presentations from each of our featured speakers, then we'll move to the interactive Q&A session where we will spend the remainder of our hour. We would like this to be an interactive experience for you. So if you have any questions at any time, please go to the questions area and you go to webinar control panel and send us your questions. We can't promise to get all of them in, but we'll do our best and we'll follow up on af afterwards with any questions we do not get to today. A few logistical notes about the webinar today. Links to today's presentation and video recording will be sent out to all attendees in 24 hours of the event. Those who would like CPE credits will need to answer all polling questions during the event and should have pre-registered for the event. Finally, after the webinar is over, you'll be asked to take a short survey today regarding the webinar. We greatly appreciate your feedback about our event today as we always strive to improve the ROI we offer our event attendees for their valuable time. Before we get started with our first speaker, a quick word about Performative. Performative is the largest online community and resource for senior level corporate finance, accounting, treasury, and related leaders. Performative connects corporate finance leaders to provide instant advice and insights on the tough financial and strategic challenges they face every day. Our first speaker will share with us why more and more companies of all sizes across a diverse set of industries are evaluating and will be making ERP investments in the near term. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Ben Kang. Ben Kang is currently a senior product marketing manager at NetSuite and has prior work experiences in both the software industry and professional services. Prior to NetSuite, Ben performed product marketing for Oracle Corporation, supporting software sales of corporate finance modeling and planning products to companies around the world. Prior to working in the software industry, Ben worked as a consultant and accountant at Deloitte where he earned his CPA while serving in the financial services industry. He holds an MBA from Northwestern University and has a BS in Business Administration from the University of California, Berkeley. With that, it is my distinct pleasure to hand the floor over to Ben Kang. Ben, the floor is yours. Please take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ernie. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, ERP implementations, there isn't just one good reason. And I think what I like to share with you is that they happen for a variety of reasons. And many of them are good ones. If you just look at some of the ones that take place across a survey of companies that was done recently, uh, they're ones that you would actually expect. You know, improving business performance, looking to integrate systems across different locations, trying to ensure regulatory compliance and reporting. Uh, this was a study that was done just recently last year and published just a few weeks ago. But if you look at these reasons, they're ones that are probably timeless. In fact, if you were to go back for the last five years, uh, you would probably see that if a similar survey were done, you'd see many of the same usual suspects. So I think the reason why I want to bring that to your attention is that when it comes to ERP implementations, there's many reasons for doing them, and they happen to be the same ones. And there really isn't a clear, runaway, popular reason that's going to ensure that your implementations are going to be a success. And I think that's a big, one of the big reasons why a lot of us are going to be on this call today. So by the time we're done, uh, you know, we're hopefully going to be able to share with you some advice and some best practices on how to approach ERP implementations so that they can maximize and optimize your ROI. Because ERP implementations can have poor results regardless of whatever your reasons are for doing them. So based on some of the trends we're seeing today, uh, my goal is to share with you how choosing the right technology can give you better control in influencing the outcome of an ERP implementation and optimizing your investment. So what we're seeing today is that many finance leaders are expecting their businesses to become more complex in the near future. And in my line of work, I spend quite a bit of time talking to controllers and CFOs across various industries. And one comment I hear very often is how their business models are becoming more complex as their companies grow. Finding new sources of revenue, for example, through international expansion. 
or product companies who want to start selling services or subscriptions, or companies who are doing an acquisition because they want to penetrate a new market that they haven't done before. And meanwhile, while they're trying to pursue those growth objectives, businesses are also pressured to control their G&A and to look for ways to be more efficient while supporting those growth strategies. And what all these events have in common is that it introduces change into the way that companies have to run their businesses. And if you find yourself in the camp that's expecting more complexity in the next two years, it's worth asking whether your current ERP can handle the kind of business change that's expected. And then the changing landscape of accounting regulations is also having an impact on businesses. So for one thing, when rules are changing, like revenue recognition, which FASB and ISB have been working on uh, jointly for the last several years, when finance has to consider something like revenue recognition and then look at their operations and understand whether they have the processes and controls in place to comply, what if the business requires you to issue financials under more than one standard of accounting, like IFRS? And if your company will do business internationally, can you meet those reporting requirements as rules change, not for just the one standard you are used to complying with, but for multiple standards all over the world. Just as with increasing complexity, it's fair to ask yourself, can your ERP handle this kind of expected regulatory change? So those are some of the things that we've been noticing externally that's impacting finance departments. And I'd like to share with you that as much as we're seeing change taking place externally, we're also seeing change taking place internally within the finance profession itself. So what we're looking at here are the results of a survey done by the IMA very recently in which it's showing that when it comes to the CFO role, the demands being placed on them in the workplace are changing. And it's been trending this way for the past three years. And here in this particular chart, we're seeing that CFOs are becoming more directly involved in strategic decision making and analysis in addition to the day-to-day -day finance execution responsibilities that they already carry. And as a result, their direct role in the day-to-day -day financial execution tasks has been reduced. And so it almost begs the question, is there a risk of overburdening that's taking place? And what we're finding is that there is evidence to suggest that new tools and technologies are being used to alleviate some of that increasing burden. And to keep up with the increasing demands of the CFO, we're also seeing that there are downstream effects taking place as well. So in the same IMA survey, we're seeing similar patterns changing in the role of the controller, who's trying to utilize a broader set of skills to really help drive business performance and deliver value-added business intelligence. And as a result, they've also been increasing their relationship building activities, being less of a what I'll call a traditional back office presence, and acting more as business partners. And as controllers have been acting more as business partners, they've started to adopt this perception that they're the go-to person for anyone in the organization that has a need for data and information, whether it's financial data, budgeting data, operational data, or customer data. The request for access is high, and it's compelling controllers to really look at the ways of how they're going to accommodate demand from so many people. So what's happening from a systems or a technology perspective is that there's this perceived need that they're trying to get more out of their systems and yet at the same time drive down their operating costs so that they can do analytics more effectively. So while roles are evolving, it's also worth noting very importantly that the core responsibilities that financial managers have to carry, still they haven't gone away. So for maintaining effective controls, performing sound financial and management reporting, and doing a timely close, these core responsibilities are still there and the responsibilities are increasing. And with these core responsibilities, it's not like for many of these departments, the situation is ideal. They're actually facing obstacles right now that are repeating their performance. So how is finance supposed to find the bandwidth to take on more responsibility and at the same time deal with these challenges, which if you look at some of these sub-bullet points, they actually mirror some of the same reasons that you saw earlier about why companies are doing ERP implementations. So although these pain points are significant enough to justify an ERP investment, it's very important to align the decision to not just look at the pains that you're facing right now operationally, but to also account for the change that's expected in taking place externally and internally, what's happening to your business climate, 
what's happening to a regulatory perspective, what's happening to your roles. And one way to control for that change is to really look for technology that can meet those needs, not just for today, but in the future. So how do you future-proof your technology for success and exert as much control as you can? And what we notice is that the companies who seem to be successful at doing that, they start by asking the question that you're seeing in the header. You know, they're asking themselves, is the company prepared for growth? And then there's a discussion that would usually take place where they're addressing topics like, well, what's the company going to look like? How is the company going to meet those milestones? Think about revenues and profitability in the future and what it's going to do to the company, say, three years from now. And then given the expected size of the company with those projections, how many employees will that be? How many monthly paychecks will that be? How many expense reports? How many customers will there be? How many services projects will be running? Finance could look at those metrics, the resulting processes, and the way processes are currently done. And they'll notice that some will stay in place and scale if, for example, you add another two add to the process. And other processes, on the other hand, really need to be examined from where it is today and where it needs to be, and what's the path that has to take place when the company reaches that size. Those are some of the things and factors of gaps and confidence in your ERP that need to take place. And then again, asking, can the ERP system handle it? That's planning for growth and scale. So ideally, we find that companies want to be able to get on one system that can handle as many processes and as much of each process as possible. They'd like one system to record the sales lead at the very beginning and then track prospects and then generate estimates and then book orders, build those orders, and then track the shipping and inventory and record the revenue and collect the cash without worrying about manually managing handoffs between systems or people. It's much more efficient and easier to get the consolidated view and not having to worry about the quality of the data falling apart at the handoffs. Also, what about rolling up financials across distributed offices, say in California, Mexico, and London? Well, it's easier if your people are all using the same data and processes, and it should be easy to have the same process and controls in place from subsidiary to subsidiary so that you are always confident knowing that your processes are working the same way across all locations. And then this should also apply to metric setting and making sure that works across all your subsidiaries. The same report that can be used at headquarters and for the general manager with one system across locations. Build it once and then share it. And then as the company evolves, you want to be able to stay on that one system. It doesn't help to invest significant time and resources to get on the one system and then, for example, acquire another company only to have a new system to deal with. You want to be in a position where you can deploy agilely enough to keep up with the speed of change. So if you could have one system that could handle all of your core processes, not just for accounting, but also for your other functions like sales, support, and HR, well then all that data that you're accumulating that you're going to possess, it's going to actually give you a 360 degree view of your customer. And from the CEO to the accounting staff to your vendors and customers, everyone will always be looking at the same information. You're always going to have transparency. And as finance leaders, a single system can help foster collaboration so that with that transparency, everyone can both inside and outside the organization be productive working together. Nothing's going to fall through the cracks when everyone is on the same system using it. And then when you have that one system, you will inherently also get real-time visibility across the organization. So just imagine all the different areas of your processes, from financials, a sales pipeline, HR across the different regions, they all sit on a single system. You and everyone else in the organization can have a custom single view of the metrics that matter to you no matter what industry or business you're in. And then when I say real-time information, you want it to be real-time all the time, especially when there's change, not just for the first few months after you go live, but all the time. So take an acquisition, for example. Imagine a corporate controller who can be able to go into a system, open a new subsidiary, and then immediately have the chart of accounts and processes and customizations from day one. So it would be helpful to have a system that you can set up and have immediately available. And then with real-time, think about cash collections. What if you're in a business where you want to make daily cash collections at the end of the month? How could you do this if your data isn't real-time? So if you think about an ERP investment that's worthwhile to your needs, with real-time visibility, you have the chance to focus on analysis and decision-making more effectively, which mirrors, again, some of the reasons we saw earlier on as to why companies are doing ERP implementations. 
But having a system to handle your core processes doesn't guarantee that you can keep everyone on the system after you go live. So in order to preserve this kind of investment, a system has to be able to accommodate your business model as you evolve. And so to support growth, it has to be able to be modified. So for example, if your business were to launch a new product or enter a new territory that's different from your existing business, there's almost always a need to modify processes or create new workflows. So what kind of impact will these new changes have on your current processes, and how long will it take to make the modifications you need? And whether you have to modify your ports, collect new pieces of information, or introduce new processes, you should assume that business and regulatory change, it'll be inevitable. And sometimes you just don't know when it's going to happen. So your ERP should enable you to work with a very efficient set of scarce resources without having to reinvent the wheel. Change only what needs to be changed, and don't subject yourself to a multi-multi-month rollout to make the change. And most importantly, you don't want to have to wait for things to break before you need to take action. And then lastly, you want a system that's going to fit with your priorities. We want to know now, and we're very real-time oriented. There's a culture of availability that everyone can experience. And we also want to be mobile, especially if you're a distributed organization with distributed processes. Imagine a distributed process that starts in Sydney, and then the document moves to US for approval, and then it moves to the Philippines for provisioning, and then the document moves back to California for final audit. Anyone can pick up the transaction and simply put it back into the system, which is essentially simulate people as if they were sitting physically side by side processing work. And we also want to self-serve. So imagine services businesses who can now track and report time quickly using just the mobile device, and then they could submit expense reimbursements with a simple snapshot of a receipt and then submitting it from anywhere. Rather than waiting until the end of the week to try and remember how you spent your time and money on Monday and Tuesday, work productively while you are on the go so that you can concentrate more on client service instead of administration work. So that is what I have to share from a technology perspective in terms of how you can influence the ERP implementation outcome by making sure you're comfortable with what the technology should do for you. Now my distinct pleasure to welcome our next speaker to the webinar, um, Dan Feely. Dan Feely is a managing partner and founder of Transforming Solutions Incorporated, TSI, a rapidly growing performance improvement consultancy. In his career, Dan has led well over 100 business and IT transformation projects while averaging over 10 software evaluation, selection, and many implementation projects each year. Dan started his career with Anderson Consulting, where he spent the majority of his time performing operational and technology review and improvement projects in a number of industries in the U.S. and New England. Dan received a Bachelor of Science with Honors in Operations Management Information Systems from Northern, University, Northern Illinois University, graduating with Academic and Athletic Honors. He also serves on the board of Northern Illinois University, College of Business, NIU Executive Club, and in an advisory capacity for several Chicago-based companies and nonprofit organizations. With that, it is my distinct pleasure to hand the floor over uh, to Dan Feely, who's going to offer us a compelling overview of 10 best practices you can use to optimize your ERP investment. Dan, the floor is yours. Please left-click on your screen and take it away. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ernie. And uh, I really appreciate the uh, gracious introduction and, and Ben, wonderful job on those initial slides. So uh, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. I'm Dan Feely, the managing partner of TSI. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here with you today. And thanks to Performative for inviting me and certainly uh, to NetSuite, this session's uh, sponsor. So my goal is to really get into the details around what we feel are the 10 best practices for optimizing your ERP investment. And to do this effectively, I want to try to break this down into three areas. First, I want to talk about uh, kind of an ERP optimization context to get a better sense of both how you view optimization and then share a little bit of perspective about who TSI is and what we've done in this space that lends us some credibility in this area. And then next, what I'll do is I'll cover the 10 best practices. And I'll be honest with you, some of these were based on some lessons, lessons that we've learned over the years. So I'm going to do my best to, to try to um, uh, share some information so you don't have to learn some of the lessons that I've learned in my career and certainly some of my colleagues to really get you at a position so you can get the most out of your investment in new technology. And then lastly, we'll open it up to some Q&A. So let's, to get us started for a second, a little bit about TSI and what gives us a little bit of context to talk about um, optimization. So first, you know, TSI for about 20 years has been providing services around helping mid-market companies grow and thrive. What we focus on 
our people, process, and technology challenges that many of our mid-market and higher education clients uh, struggle with. Uh, as Ernie mentioned, we lead between 10 and 15 software evaluations each year. And it's a, uh, something that's really important to our clients so we can, from an objective perspective, help them go through the very difficult process of establishing a business case and thinking about what are the right requirements, what are the right software vendors that they should be looking at in order to make the best decision. Um, as I mentioned, or may have mentioned, we are independent from software vendors, so our clients select us because we do 10 to 15 of these a year. We don't have a financial relationship with any software vendor, yet we work closely with them from the perspective of we, we interact with, with many, of these, uh, many of these vendors every year, um, many times during these evaluations, so it's a good way for us to get to know the capabilities of the software vendors. And then after that, we often help our clients on the implementation. Because of the complexities around the process change and change management, many times the job position change, job change, organization change, there are a lot of complexities that go along with the implementation in addition just the complexities from a technology perspective. From a client standpoint, uh, we do work with a, a number of fast-growing companies. You may mention, you may recognize a few of these up on the screen. As a matter of context, we do work with three of the top fast, 20 fastest-growing companies in the Chicago area and a number of other companies throughout the U.S. and even some that are, are international. We do um, work to help answer questions around uh, that many of our clients have with respect to have we outgrown our technology? What's the business case to replace it? What should we replace it with? How should we implement it? What implementation partner should we use? How should we manage change? How do we truly realize business value that could be transformative to us with respect to our growth? So in a nutshell, we're help, helping our clients before the technology evaluation, helping them to assess their existing situation to see if there is tangible value to change, helping them to analyze their processes for efficiency opportunities, and then both during and after the software selection to help implement the technology along with a lot of that change that goes with that. So let's talk about kind of the ERP optimization context. So optimization means a lot to different people. And in a second, we're going to ask you your opinion about what optimization means to you. So I'm curious what it does mean. Does it mean pay as little as you can for that new software? Does it mean to exploit functionality as best as you can? Do you want to use it to transform how your organization works? Do you want to use it as a lever to drive more revenues, reduce expense, reduce staff, improve product and service quality? Or so uh, one of the things already did not mention during his extremely gracious introduction is our consulting firm is based in the Chicago area. And we've just gone through what I think is about the second or third worst winter on record. So many of us that haven't been outside in quite some while we, uh, at least those, those of us that have a, uh, an interest in golf or any other activities, I decided when we talk about optimization, we're going to work with a little bit of a golf metaphor, so bear with me for a second. But when you think about some of the trends around op optimization and really thinking about it as a tool to transform, think about a golf club as a tool to transform your golf game. Now, I'm guessing I'm not the only one on this webinar that's a, from a colder, a colder region, so hopefully you can all indulge me in this, in this for a second. But if you were to think of your existing technology, and if you were to think about using a golf club as a pictorial representation of what your technology is, would it look like these golf clubs that are on the screen today? Or would it look a little bit more advanced? So again, if we think about our golf clubs, uh, metaphorically, and we think about our ERP as a tool, how does that help or hinder your performance? Let's talk about how we think about, again, our ERP or our golf clubs metaphorically as a tool to improve the optimization or improve the efficiency of our business. But um, just like new golf clubs, think, like, think about the new enterprise system that you might be thinking about. And think about what that new enterprise system would have with a new set of golf clubs that you would, there it goes, with a new set of golf clubs that would come out. So when you think about these new golf clubs or a new enterprise system, a couple perspectives that they have in common. First of all, they're not free. In fact, often they could be expensive, and that expense could be significant. Secondly, when you think about either new golf clubs or new enterprise systems, 
there's often a lot of packages, a lot of options to choose from. Uh, third, there's folks within your organization or maybe within your household to say, what you have is good enough. You don't need to change. Fourth, with respect to changing golf clubs or enterprise systems, you have to do something with the old system or old clubs. You have to learn how to use the new ones. You have training, you have coaching, you have lessons, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of similarities between the golf clubs and a new enterprise system. And certainly when you think about that new enterprise system, as it says here on the slide, the stakes are high. And when you think about making that leap to the new system, and you've probably read various articles, whether it be in Harvard Business Review or others, about 70% of ERP uh, implementations either fail, they fail to deliver value, some actually might make things worse than before. So it's really important when we think about the concept, the context of optimization to think about some of these things and we think about some of these things that are at risk. Things like your organization's resources, things like the realization of your strategic plan as well that could include reducing expenses, revenue growth, and using this as an acquisition platform like you mentioned in the poll, using this as a uh, a lever to transform the organization, but even into, even personally, depending upon the role you play, your raise, your promotion, your job, your reputation, even your health and sanity can be at risk whether this goes well or whether it doesn't go well. So let me highlight some of the key challenges and then we'll dive into detail about each of these. This picture, if you want to start up at the top left, for us is a little bit of the manifestation uh, pictorially of some of the challenges. And so when we think about this, for us to be confident to optimize our ERP, we have to zero in on some of these most prevalent challenges. Now, some of these might seem obvious on the, on the surface, but let's face it, if it was easy, we'd never read articles like we have in Harvard Business Review and, and many other places. And over the years that TSI has been doing work in this area, we've paid very close attention to some, some of the things that work, some of the things that don't work. So, Follow with me around this slide starting at the top left and we'll cover some of these challenges and then later in the presentation we'll dive into detail. First one is, have we defined or have you defined your project's definition of success as it relates to this? And while that might sound basic, so many times do we work with organizations where there is no definition for success or it's either poorly defined or maybe it's defined and it's poorly communicated. But when you think about this from a finance accounting tax operational perspective, what are your specific departmental goals, what are your customer oriented goals that you would want to be different when you get that new system? Think about it with respect to our new golf clubs. How many strokes off your golf game would you want to have uh, occurring for you to feel good about the expense associated with those new clubs? For me, it might just be one or two because I'm a terrible golfer, but for others, maybe they have a higher expectation. But then beyond that, have you, are, have you really articulated this definition for success and communicated that throughout your organization? Another key challenge, if you follow with me below, is not picking the right system. So often do we find uh, organizations that have read uh, an article, have seen an infomercial or done something, heard from someone who they play golf with, to then use that as the basis to select their new system. These are complex, especially when you um, completed the pool, a poll before around the complexity or the business model changing. Your business model very likely is different than the person who's saying, hey, system ABC works great, you ought to use that. So that's a really important aspect is making sure we have a system to fit your needs. Third, having the right expertise to implement the system. And I'm not talking just technical expertise, but really, functional process change management uh, expertise. We see shortcuts taken all the time, and those are the same things that folks might have the expectation, great, you load it on, and it's going to work perfectly. They say best practices come with it, but when you think about it, the right system implemented the wrong way, sometimes based on the wrong expertise, the same end result can occur, and that is you have an unusable or suboptimized system. Fourth, we, we really like to, to encourage our clients and work with our clients to have process-centric, forward-looking requirements. That acts as the basis for you to do an evaluation, selection, and implementation. Quick story I'll tell you. Uh, just recently, we completed a project audit for an organization that was getting ready to implement a major ERP. They had about 8,000 requirements, and they were not organized in any particular order. 
So there was really no organization, no taxonomy of these, these requirements. It was just a list of 8,000 requirements in an Excel spreadsheet that were very backward looking. In fact, a lot of these requirements were really asking the new ERP to act like the old enterprise archaic mainframe system they were looking to retire. So this was used to be the basis to evaluate and select and implement their new system. And I bet you can guess how that, how that turned out, obviously not very well. The next two points, leadership and vision. And again, and this is another one that might sound a little bit cliche, but truly how engaged, committed, and supportive is your senior management team to a project like this? Where does this project fall relative to other things that are going on and other things within your strategic plan this year? And lastly, really, when you think about it from beginning to end, how have you involved or how has your organization involved the right resources, including an internal team, corporate versus field personnel? Have you thought about using backfill when you have this kind of dream team of, of quality subject matter experts to play a role on a project? How is your implementation talent? Have you taken a process-centric approach? What time of the year do you plan to do this? Do you have the right funds? And we'll talk more about these things as it relates to change management. So, you know, in the spirit of the, of the saying, experience is mean but efficient, we learned a lot of these throughout 20 years of, of us being in business and us doing this early in our career, in some cases not necessarily having the, the benefit of all that experience behind us. Now we do, and I want to make sure that we share this with you. So let me go through the 10 different uh, areas that I really want to focus on to really make sure that we're optimizing the ERP to make sure that it's, it's a success. So the first one is an ounce of selection is worth a pound of implementation. So we're obviously stealing uh, another well-known phrase, but when we think about this, an optimized system doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen because the project plan was good or the implementation plan was good. It really starts with a good project team that has defined great requirements that form the basis of a fact-based selection. And I'll talk about that, uh, that chart right up on the screen in a second. So at the risk of saving the obvious, you have a better selection, you have a better chance of doing a great selection when you've set yourself up to do a great selection based on these requirements that are driven by the right team. And once you've done that, really what you've done is you've set yourself up to have a more cost-effective, a more predictable, and a more effective implementation that has a high probability for success. As I mentioned earlier, TSI does about 10 to 15 software evaluations per year. We take a very quantitative approach to it. The radar chart in the middle shows an aggregated scoring after we did a scripted evaluation with, uh, that went between two finalist vendors. So when you take a look at this and you take a look at the blue versus the red shading, you can see that the blue shading has a better overall fit, but it's not better in all areas. And so what this does graphically is it begins to show both coverage in terms of the requirements as well as efficiencies. And so this is just an area, I just wanted to show this as an example of the type of analysis do and the type of analysis you can certainly do to begin thinking about what are your needs, what are the software vendors' uh, capabilities relative to your needs, not relative to someone else's needs. But what this also does is begin to show you in what areas might you expect to see or configuration, or customization, or potentially even risk as it relates to the implementation. So again, as I like to say, a great implementation begins months before the implementation even gets started. A few more points about this is it's not just about functionality and selection. We talked a little bit about preparation, but that continues into the contract that gets negotiated between you and the software vendor. So again, some of the areas that need to be reviewed prior to signing a contract with the ERP vendor will include things like forward-looking functionality and requirements. We'll talk more about the requirements later. Often we like to say that these requirements should be part of the agreement that ultimately you make in the contract as part of the contract with the vendor. Taking a look at the technology requirements and doing a technology due diligence, whether it's on-premise, whether it's cloud-based, whatever the case might be, taking a look at that aspect of it. Um, the vendor, the software implementation partner credentials and their references. What is the business case to do this? There's another thing when we get into cost, typically, traditionally, folks used to, used to refer to this as TCO, total cost of ownership. But then what we realize is we're, we're forgetting two important elements. So the T and S at the end relate to transition and support. So when you look at the total cost of ownership, you need to include the cost of transition 
and the cost, the cost of ongoing support to get from where you are to, the, to where you need to go. Really important aspects when you think about the selection and the contractual piece of this, and ultimately leading up to the optimization. And then lastly, thinking about what does this high-level implementation plan look like? What do the milestones look like, et cetera, et cetera? So again, when, when we're picking the right system, negotiating the right contract with the right service level agreements within that, that is a great way to get started on the right foot. Along those lines, you know, it, it, it's kind of interesting with, with respect to people's memory. You know, I'm not sure about you. Sometimes I forget what I had for breakfast this morning, but if someone tells me, how long it will take or how much it will cost, just like many of our clients, I have an uncanny remember, uh, memory about what that will be. So what I learned early on in my career is there's safety and ranges. And when we think about early on in a project where you might just be developing business cases and you haven't even seen a software vendor, we talk about when our clients say, how, how long will it take and what will it cost? We think about wide ranges, plus or minus 50 to 100%. At this point, we might not even know what the scope is exactly. And then we we'll get to the point of learning more about the requirements and doing more about the, or diving into the technology evaluation. We learn more about what those viable options are. And so this range between that plus or minus 100%, well, maybe we can go plus or minus 50%. And then we might actually select the vendor and start the project, and then we might be plus or minus 30 or 40 percent. And then when we get into the design sessions, the configuration, developing, testing, then maybe we're plus or minus 10 percent. All the while, scope can change and some other variables can change. But this is a technique that we found, as basic as it might sound, but the safety and ranges when we're working and talking with our executives to get us out of a situation of being uh, so specific, it gets us into uh, a difficult situation, and we are, are always able to add some contingency. So I found that using this model, orienting our project sponsors to this range and this theory, and talking about them, talking about this with them from day one, really helps to uh, take some pressure off when trying to predict this to the dollar. And, and then I'm guessing on, on the vendor end, sometimes you get put into some awkward situations as it relates to how much it will cost sometimes before a scope is even defined. Is there anything that you might want to add to something like this or any of the earlier, earlier slides? Uh, thank you, Dan. Um, I think that what you shared is very consistent with what we've been seeing. And so uh, the one thing that I'll add when it comes to uh, trying to estimate um, the milestones, benefits, and costs is to also think about, um, you know, the, we always talk about the amount of time that takes place during the implementation from a resource perspective, whether uh, it's going to be something that's going to require 40 hours a week from uh, the client or if it's something that's going to require less. But otherwise, this is spot on. Great. Thanks. So I'll, I'm going to pick up the pace just a little bit to make sure that we have some time for questions at the end as well. The, the third point that I think is really key, what we often call don't pave the cow path. And maybe you've heard some of this saying in, 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 uh, in the past, but Let's go back to our golf metaphor for a second. So when you think about those brand new golf clubs, think about it like that shiny new ERP. So what happens when you put that shiny new golf club in the hands of someone like me that has a relatively bad golf swing? What do you think that happens to the performance of my game? For me, it means I'm hitting in the, in the fairway next to me as opposed to the rough next to me. So it, it doesn't necessarily make things better. Now, the same holds true when you think about what your business processes look like. And I know with respect to the earlier poll, folks talked about transforming, talked about efficiency with business processes. So if you want to optimize your implementation, we have to optimize the processes first or levering the tool that you've, you've selected. So consider the following. How do your customers see you when they interact with your organization? How would they describe your experience, the experience they have with your organization when they ask for a quote, a proposal, an estimate, an order, how easy or hard is it for them to work with your organization? And then even internally, how easy or hard is it for some of your departments to work with other departments to get their work done? This is what's so important when we think about using that new system and optimizing the new system. Just like a new golf club, a new system isn't going to be a panacea for these, for these issues if they're not addressed. So when we think about paving the cow path, this is a kind of a simple uh, illustration. 
with a client that we've done work with where at the end of the day their business was about receiving an order, verifying its accuracy, and routing it for shipment and generating an invoice. And all of those meanderings that you see above and below that line were things that they did that weren't requested by a customer but were some manual ways that they were meandering off that cow path and adding uh, unnecessary expense to the equation that if they didn't address this first, all they would be doing is using an ERP along with a lot of sloppy processes along the way. So again, non-value added steps and unnecessary variation can lead to scope creep, and that's the enemy of what we like to call O'Tiffany projects. So what is O'Tiffany? O'Tiffany is on time, in full, no errors. And so to achieve that on time, in full, no errors project, we have to streamline some of this variation because it adds no value. So ultimately what we want to do is avoid the frustration that's associated with doing this wrong. So really think about these questions as examples to begin thinking about with your key constituents and subject matter experts when thinking about A, what are your requirements, B, what you want your processes to look like, and ultimately C, how do you want your implementation team to configure the software that you've, you've purchased. Okay, item number four we call small bang works better than big bang. And many times our clients say, should we go big bang and implement this all at once or should we think about phases? And I'll just be blunt, long traditional waterfall projects that don't show value for many months more often than not fail. We really want to stay away from those. You know, there's a reason why agile software development methods were, de were developed and that's because they're effective. Because many of us have short spans of attention you want to see something for the investment that we put in place. So in our view, big bang equals big risk. And so really from a, a lot of perspectives, we want to think about how do we chunk this project up in a way that keeps people really excited, keeps them interested, showing some value every 30 to 45 days, and really creates a mechanism for continued deployment and continued excitement so it lessens the risk and keeps people really engaged. Often if you think about stealing a law from physics, you know, a project in motion will stay in motion, so let's keep it roll. let's get it rolling and keep it, keeping it rolling. So really from an optimization perspective, these projects need to be phased almost as an absolute rule, not a general rule. A few more points that I'll hit on before we open up for questions. Um, five, we call it establish your project mantra. So one of the things that we really uh, have focused on, we not too long ago, we did work with a company that was in a lot of periodicals. It's the fastest growing company in history. Fastest to a billion in revenue, fastest to two billion in revenue. They had a lot of acquisitions that put them in over three dozen countries in year three of their existence. We were involved to lead their software evaluation and a lot of other process improvement. And they wanted to do this essentially overnight, if not before. So really it was it forced us to really rethink about our methodology and rethink of a number of things. And so one of the, the phrases we coined with them is good not good now is better than perfect later. And I'm not talking about being material materially reckless, but I'm talking about good now, which means you might not get to the tenth global report. We'll focus on the first eight. So this took on a life of its own in a really positive way. This set the stage for how quickly decisions was made were made. So ultimately, we went live with a, a cloud-based ERP in five countries in just about six weeks, 26 countries in three months. Every single one of those, the books were, was closed and it was accurate. So this is just an example of some things that can help really keep a project moving along. Along with the next one, we like to say paint the picture. And so for any of you that's done you know, some house renovation or things like that, what's gotten you really excited? Most often, it's some kind of a mock-up or blueprint or some visual representation. Same with an ERP. Folks need to see what it's going to look like. They need to feel what it's going to look like. They have to be able to answer the question, what's in it for me? So painting the picture and getting folks to know and connect with it emotionally, and we'll talk a little bit about more, more about that in a slide or two, is really, really important. Another item that we like to say, have a stance. How many times have you been involved with projects like this, folks are going to ask questions. Will there be a reduction in staff? 
Are there for manual forms that are going away? Is this department going to get re 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 reorganized? So really from an executive perspective, it is mission critical to make sure that you have a perspective and you have a stance on what these issues are so rumors don't run rampant and then ultimately you have a change management issue to deal with. Now speaking of change management, one of the things that's really important, number eight here, is really know and manage your readiness for change. And I'll share with you a link that we use. It's a free link. It's on our website. You can use it within your teams. But when we think about your readiness for change, these are the six factors that we think are the most important. These are the six factors that need to be most importantly, more, most important and in line. So executive leadership and support, does your organization have that? Does your organization have the capacity to change? Has your organization done this in the past or made any kind of transformation? In other words, do you have a predisposition toward improvement? How clear is your destination? How available are your resources? How aligned with this is your business strategy? So these are the factors that we think are most important to avoid what you see in the middle of this slide, the dip. So when you think about your own performance and productivity over time, and you implement any change, especially in ERP, then you get into that point of the middle of the slide called the transition state. So from a change management perspective, what you want to do, what we want to do when we're working with our clients is do what we can from a communication and education, a training, a reinforcement perspective to minimize the length and depth of that transition state. We want to be very intentional and very proactive about it so you can very quickly get to that uphill slope of transforming and making the gain that you ultimately were excited about when you purchased that new enterprise system. So I believe these slides will be made available for everyone, but here's a link where you can go and you can fill out on a 1 to 10 scale each of your perspectives from a change management perspective, and you could even do this as a team internally and compare scores. And often if you want to take a straight 90%, 80%, 70% split, it'll give you a sense on what would you give yourself an A, B, C, or a failing grade with respect to your readiness for change. So that's a tool that you can use certainly after this. Now the last couple slides I'm going to talk a little bit about knowing and managing your subject matter expert or your constituent emotions. Now this is something we didn't think too much about, even when we were getting into change management fairly early. But this is beyond just readiness for change. To us, optimizing your ERP requires that you have more than just a passing clue about how your constituents are feeling about this implementation. So when you think about this, two dimensions to consider. When you think about your constituents, what is their collective level of fear or confidence? Is it high? Is it low? Is it scattered or is it aligned along a particular score? And then secondly, how enthusiastic or apathetic would you gauge your constituents to be? How convicted are they to this effort? What we like to do, and we're starting to do a lot more of this lately, is basically creating an index and tracking this over time. How does this range between positive, neutral, or negative? So really tracking this, staying on top of this, and then doing what we can, again, from a change management perspective, from a communications perspective, from a leveraging buy-in perspective, even sitting with folks on a one-on-one -on -one basis to begin moving this score up and certainly preventing it from going down. And, and at all implementations, it's, it's always going to be wavering all over the map, and our, our challenge is to keep it toward the top end of the screen. The last point I want to go through really relates to the constituents and the project team. It, it, certainly our experience tells us it's mission critical in optimizing your ERP. You have to get the right people on your bus. And really your bus meaning your project team and the folks surrounding the project team, including the folks that play different governance roles from a steering committee perspective and others. You need to pick your stars. You need to fill your gaps. You need to make sure you get the wrong people off of the bus so they don't tank, taint the right people you have on the bus. So this is so important. You know, stars shine on projects like this, and certainly the rocks sink. And some studies that I've read, and certainly our experience would certainly correlate with this, you could easily expect to lose 10% of your project team, especially if it's a very intense uh, implementation project. And these are really opportunities that we really encourage our organizations to use 
to challenge people within their organization to see who their next stars are, see who wants to rise to the top, and who the next level of senior management stars are. So this is another thing that, that as it relates to optimizing your ERP, getting the right people on the bus and, and seeing what type of a leadership role they'll play is really important. So in summary, and just to wrap up before we get into Q&A, here's a list that I'll leave with you, but really think about two things. One, it's all about doing the right prep, taking the right steps to pick the right system. It doesn't just happen on the day the software vendor shows up. Second, it is so critical to implement it the right way with the right talent, with the right process focus and customer orientation. Again, optimizing ERP begins with realizing that it's not just about the ERP, it's about a lot more, including all of those change dimensions as well. Ben, is there anything else that you would like to add to these slides before we get into some of the Q&A? Uh, no, Dan, that was excellent. Uh, that's very consistent with some things that we're seeing and reminds me of uh, some of the work that I did previously when I was in professional services. Well done, Dan. Well, wonderful, thanks. And I guess the last thing I would say, thanks everyone for listening, I really appreciate it. I did want to share my contact information. Don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions, if you want to connect, if you need help, especially if you're located in a warmer climate. No, I'm kidding, but I do thank you for listening. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much. Next question, um, I'll go ahead and uh, direct to, uh, to Dan. Um, can you give us um, some of your insights? Uh, you had a great slide on, I believe, your, your ninth point about keeping people engaged. Um, can you give us some insights on how companies you have worked with have helped keep their star players engaged throughout the process? Yeah, thanks, Rudy. That, that's a good question. I mean, it's, it's so hard, especially with some of these implementations, if you're in mul multiple countries. For the most part, it's, I think about the saying, keep your eye on the prize. So keep your star players to keep your team that's often working some long hours. They have to be engaged. There has to be something in it for them. They have to have, um, and I'm not talking about just rewards, but I'm talking about what can happen with them after this project is over and done with. Do they have a, a leadership spot, or are they going to be basically applying for a job at that company? Second, when we talk about kind of big bang versus small bang and carving this project up into some bite-sized pieces, that is something that I think really keeps folks excited because they can really see some more tangible results for their efforts from a configuration, from an implementation standpoint. And then it's a lot about, you know, it sounds cliche, but celebrating that. I mean, really expecting that tool to drive different results, whether it's more sales, whether it's improved quality, whatever those tangible results are but keeping an eye on that and then celebrating it when it happens. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much, um, Dan. Um, um, one, more, one more question. I think before I close Q&A, I'll, I'll ask you uh, a question um, again, Dan. Um, can you speak to us um, how you, how you um, help companies um, set the expectations of what they're expecting? for an ERP implementation and working with the, the ERP vendor and making sure that those expectations are met for the terms of the contract? Okay, that, that's a, another good question. I think what's, what's really important is it, we've, we've worked really effectively with software vendors to talk about what's realistic. I mean, I, I think we've broken some speed records from an implementation perspective and, you know, our team is really proud of those. Um, but what's really important is to have a good understanding. And in, in doing 10 to 15 of these a year, we have a lot of data to talk about how, how long things can take and should take and what's sort of the land speed record. But together, what we like to do is co-create a project plan. And we like to get their buy-in. We want to understand how quickly our clients are going to make decisions, what resources they have available. But then also developing some sort of service level agreements, SLAs within that. And the way I look at this, and you know, I'm in the middle of a, a software contract right now. These are always two-way streets. There's no way in the world that we can expect a software vendor to help configure a system if we can't make decisions within, say, a 24, 48-hour period on a lot of issues. So it's really around developing kind of that, that, that playing field and defining what that playing field is so all parties feel like this is set up to win versus going to be a one-way street, which never wins. Um, thank you very much, Dan. With that, I'll conclude the Q&A session. Again, any questions we didn't get answered, we'll coordinate with our speakers. A big thank you to Ben and Dan for their time and insights. They're clearly thought leaders in their field and excellent resource of information on today's topics. 
note in the post-webinar survey, which you'll be asked to take right after the webinar concludes. You have the opportunity to express your interest in being connected with today's speakers with just a few mouse clicks. Uh, a big thank you once again to our uh, sponsor, um, NetSuite, who made this uh, webinar possible and available at no cost. And finally, a big thank you to the audience for your uh, valuable time. Um, make the rest of your day great, everyone. Thank you very much.